He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and a very warm welcome to Elemental, a chemistry podcast for, mostly, non-chemists from RNZ. Not that that's where the non-chemists are all from. I'm Alison Ballins. <laughs> and I'm Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology. And this is episode 57 in our alphabetical celebration of the periodic table. And we are up to palladium. Speaking of the letter P, and completely beside the point, but never mind, I was looking at our list of element names and I was pondering on what might be the most popular first letter and wondering if it could be P because there seem to be quite a few P elements coming up in the series. But it turns out that P is only the third equal most popular first letter. So C takes out first prize with 12, T is the second most popular and S and P are third equal. Sorry about that dog leg, Alan. It just got me curious. Do tell me all about palladium. The vital statistics, as we always start with. Okay, so the elemental symbol PD and the atomic number 46. And so palladium has got a lot in common with its neighbours on the periodic table. So platinum, rhodium, ruthenium, iridium, osmium. And we did osmium a couple of episodes ago. And um, these all form a group of elements commonly referred to as the platinum group metals. And they have quite similar chemical properties, uh, but palladium has got the lowest melting point and it's the least dense of all of them. So where did it get its name from? In fact, it was named after an asteroid of all things, uh, the asteroid Pallas. And that was discovered around about the same time as the element was, and that was around about in 1803. And the asteroid itself was named after the Greek goddess of wisdom, Pallas. So does palladium have lots in common with osmium then? Yes, and in fact its discovery is a very similar story to the discovery of osmium. So if you recall, there was the discoverer of the element osmium, a guy by the name of Smithson Tennant, and um, the guy who discovered palladium, William Wollaston, they were best mates and they were also collaborators. And both of them were interested in what happened with these impure samples of platinum when you tried to dissolve them in aqua regia. And um, Tennant got osmium from the uh, insoluble fraction that was left when uh, platinum was attempted to be dissolved in aqua regia. And Wollaston analysed the solution that you got out of that. And from that solution, he managed to isolate both palladium and another element, rhodium, which we'll be talking about in a while from this particular solution. So the biggest source of palladium is now Russia, and um, South Africa and Canada are both important sources. So like other precious metals like uh, platinum, for example, the metal resists corrosion, and that makes it very useful in things like jewellery, obviously. So white gold, for example, is gold alloyed with palladium. Apart from this expensive bling, what else do we use it for? Interestingly, the metal finds extensive use in catalytic converters in cars. And in fact, this, this is the major use of palladium these days. So the trick with a catalyst is they speed up reactions, don't they? Yes. But they yep. don't themselves get used up. So what is a palladium catalyst actually doing in a car exhaust? Very good question. Time for some hardcore chemistry here. So what the palladium catalyst is doing is it's catalyzing what we call a redox reaction, and that stands for reduction and oxidation, redox. And so in order for it to act as a very efficient catalyst, it's got to be hot. And what it actually does is it converts as much as 90% of the harmful gases in car exhaust. So the harmful gases being things like uh, unburnt hydrocarbons, uh, carbon monoxide and uh, nitrogen dioxide. And it converts these things into less noxious substances. So it can take, for example, nitrogen dioxide straight back to nitrogen, elemental nitrogen. We can turn carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. The hydrocarbons can get converted into CO2 and water vapour. Just out of interest, the history of uh, catalytic converters, you might think they're relatively recent things, but in fact they were first designed in France at the end of the 19th century. <laughs> Very interesting. But that, there were cause... hardly any cars then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So even at this time they realised the importance of uh, cleaning up the exhaust. And so the earliest catalytic converters still used platinum, iridium and palladium, these precious metals. 
So I said that the catalysts need to be hot, and by hot we're talking around about 600 degrees Celsius in order to work efficiently. So when you turn your car on the morning, obviously it takes a couple of minutes to get up to temperature, and so unfortunately your car at that stage is still emitting uncleaned exhaust when you first turn on the ignition. It would be very good if we could make catalysts that work at lower temperature, and so scientists have been working on this problem, and they've made a new class of catalysts that can be made from metal alloys that are liquid at room temperature. And these could be useful, for example, for things like carbon capture and storage in the future. And so they work by converting gaseous carbon dioxide, uh, which is what you get when you burn your fossil fuels, into solid carbon at room temperature and using only a trickle of electricity. And one of these sorts of catalysts was recently reported in 2017, and it is a mixture of powdered palladium mixed with liquid gallium. We talked about liquid gallium way back in the gallium episode, and the liquid here allows the palladium to help keep converting the low-value hydrocarbons called alkanes into the higher-value ones called alkenes and uh, without gumming up the whole shebang. Also, with the the whole temperature thing, uh, you can imagine in hybrid cars where they keep sort of switching between uh, electric and uh, petrol power, their engines are going to be running at lower temperature, and so therefore this is desperately needed, these sorts of catalysts that are going to work at uh, lower temperature. So again, the hunt is on for those. So... As I said, that's the major use of palladium, in fact, uh, in these catalytic converters. It also finds extensive use in the electronics industry in the manufacture of ceramic capacitors. And if you own any digital device, which everybody does these days, it will have palladium in it. In terms of the chemistry, for the chemists who are listening, they will certainly know uh, the names of these three scientists, Richard Heck, Aichi Nagichi, and Akira Suzuki, because they won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2010 for developing methods to make carbon-carbon bonds under very mild conditions using palladium catalysts. And these carbon-carbon bonds, this is kind of the organic chemistry holy grail where you're making new molecules by sticking carbons together. Not the easiest thing in the world to do, and these three guys definitely deserve the Nobel Prize for their efforts in this area. Well done to them. Now, just thinking of these similarities between palladium and osmium, osmium was eye-wateringly pricey. Is it the same for palladium? Yes, indeed it is. So all of the uh, metals that we mentioned before are very expensive things, so we tend to call them precious metals. And today, palladium is worth around about 66000 New Zealand dollars a kilo, And that makes it just a little bit more expensive than gold, and it makes it about 1.5 times the price of platinum. So I think the answer is yes, it's very expensive. Uh, It is is not cheap, yes, yes, as anybody who's bought any palladium jewellery probably knows. Here's an interesting fact. If you look at the historical price of palladium, you would have noticed a 24% spike in its price between March the 20th and April the 10th, 1989. And you might think to yourself, why? And (laughs) the answer is that this was due to the announcement of a thing called cold fusion by a couple of scientists, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, on March the 23rd of that year. And the link between the two? (laughs) What's this all about? Okay, so we need some background chemistry here. So palladium metal is very, very unusual in that it can absorb at least 900 times its own volume of hydrogen gas which is really quite bizarre when you think about it. And what does that mean about the pressure of the hydrogen gas that is inside the palladium? It must be very high if it's absorbing that amount. And so this got some people to thinking that the conditions inside the palladium might be ripe for a thing called nuclear fusion to occur. Now, nuclear fusion, as I'm sure we must have talked about previously, that's the process that powers our sun. And what this involves is fusing hydrogen nuclei to form helium. And obviously if it powers our sun, that's going to require very, very high pressures and very, very high temperatures. And what Pons and Fleischmann said that they had done was they had discovered a thing called cold fusion and that this occurred at room temperature using an electrochemical cell which was equipped with a palladium electrode. It would have been fantastic. 
but I sense a butt coming on. Well, this was really cool. I, I remember this vividly, actually, because it was right at the start of, I guess, what we would call the internet now. So people were waiting with bated breath for sort of emails of, of all of this starting to come through. It wasn't instant like it is today, and it took time for all of the details and everything to get all around the world. And so, long story short, what they said they had done is that they were getting more power out of this electrochemical cell than they had put into it, and so therefore they were getting energy from somewhere. And if this was in fact the case, then the world's energy problems would have been over because basically you could then power the world using a bucket of water. Basically, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Sadly, you're right about the but. Uh, it took around about a month but then these guys were completely discredited and sadly their reputations were absolutely shot. However, despite this, there are still some diehard supporters of Cold Fusion out there on the internet to this day. There always are. <laughs> <laughs> now, can we please have our interesting palladium fact? Okay, so we were talking about catalytic converters before. So recycling of catalytic converters is a very important source of the metal. And so we get roughly about 121 tonnes of platinum, palladium and rhodium recovered globally from scrap in 2017. So that's quite a lot of these precious metals. And in fact, palladium is now so valuable that, get this, there has been an increase in the theft of catalytic converters from cars to sell for their scrap metal value. Well, that would be a bit awkward. You go to get back in your car and your exhaust is gone. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. So oh, please don't get any ideas, anybody out there, please. Now, luckily, you don't have to resort to theft for the Elemental podcast. You can have it for free any time that suits you to listen. And it can be recycled indefinitely. Each episode can be played again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And we are at rnz.co.nz forward slash chemistry, or you can find us as a podcast at Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you usually find your podcasts. We're back next time with Phosphorus. But until then, it's cheerio from me, Alan Blackman. And me, Alison Balance. Thanks for your company. Matewa. Wa.